Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for, for joining us here at the Stimson Center. Uh, my name is Samir Lalwani. I'm the director of our South Asia program here at Stimson. Uh, and I'm just here to briefly introduce the panel and then hand it off to my colleague, Elizabeth Grunkel, to uh, take it away from here. Uh, but basically, I just want to introduce sort of like this general area of discussion, uh, the topic for today, and uh, by um, my colleague Elizabeth. So first, the broad topic. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time at the Simpson Center in our program thinking not just about South Asia, but Southern Asia, uh, in which China is an essential part of that story. We've had a series running uh, with, in collaboration with War on the Rocks for um, a little over a year now, which is evaluating sort of the levels of competition uh, at the military, strategic, economic, and political levels, uh, where China is a key player in uh, the Indian Ocean, Southern Asia region. Uh, it clearly has implications for strate strategic stability uh, in the region and for US foreign policy, particularly a US foreign policy that is oriented around an Indo-Pacific strategy. So that is where we sort of would nest this conversation is within this broader discussion of Southern Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, today's topic on Pakistan's economic turmoil, strategic challenges, consequences, and contingencies uh, is looking at a, a, a range of things that have uh, uh, come together in recent months that make this an interesting topic. There's a, what we believe to be some sort of balance of payments crisis ongoing within Pakistan. Uh, the inability of, of Pakistan to pay, it's uh, to cover two months worth of exports uh, because of its foreign exchange levels have, have dipped below a certain level, which is leading to the consideration of an IMF loan. Uh, we have new challenges with the china Pakistan economic corridor. There are new players sort of coming into the mix. Uh, some successes of CPEC, but also some shortfalls that have uh, come to the come to the, risen to the surface in terms of the discussion of whether this is in fact advantageous for Pakistan and its economy going forward. Uh, and then most importantly, we have a new government in power in Pakistan, uh, led by Imran Khan's PTI party, uh, with an, a reform agenda, a Naya Pakistan reform agenda. Uh, and the brief survey evidence that you see out there on, um, on, in Pakistan suggests there's a lot of optimism in Pakistan today. Uh, a recent uh, survey done by Gallup Pakistan found that 76% of Pakistanis are hopeful that the National Assembly will be able to solve uh, major national issues. Uh, so a great deal of optimism. At the same time, this reform agenda has some challenges. There is obviously a, a welfare uh, agenda about sort of improving the quality of, of lives in Pakistan, uh, increasing jobs, uh, employment, and housing. Uh, but also there's some structural challenges, for example, taxation, which has been a perennial problem in Pakistan, increasing the number of people who pay taxes in Pakistan. And interestingly enough, there was a survey in, by Pakistan Gallup uh, in June that found that only, even though there's only 1% of Pakistanis who pay income taxes, 53% of Pakistanis think paying taxes are unjustified. Uh, it was quite a startling figure to me. So how, how for example, is Pakistan going to be able to weather these reform challenges uh, when there might be you know, high expectations, uh, but at the same time, uh, fundamental opposition to the, to the basic requirements for, for economic reform. And all these have strategic implications, again, for China, the United States, and a number of other regional parties. Um, I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues, Elizabeth, but I want to briefly introduce her because this is her first public event. Uh, so Elizabeth Rauchold is no stranger to competitive, challenging environments. She has joined us after having lived or worked in Iraq, Mexico, Pakistan, Turkey. Uh, and of course, the most competitive cutthroat environment of all, the US bureaucracy and interagency process. <laughs> so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Elizabeth and to introduce the panel and the forum for, format for today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Samir. Um, I want to start by welcoming you all and thanking you so much for making time in your afternoon to join us what, for what has proved a uh, interesting and I think very timely conversation as well. This is something we've been wanting to do at Stimson for a while. and. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists on these issues, especially as they've been in the news, particularly over the last week or so. Also want to um, welcome the folks who are joining us by live stream as well. So as we get started here, um, I will just briefly introduce our panelists. Um, in terms of format, we will then, I'll ask a couple of questions to get the uh, conversation started, and we'll open it up to the audience um, for questions after we get to hear their remarks. Um, so to my far left, we have Uzair Yunus, who is a director with Albright Stonebridge Group's South Asia practice, where he helps clients develop strategies for long-term growth in the region. Uzair previously worked as a consultant with IDB Consulting and Deloitte, as well as with 32 Advisors, which is a boutique consulting firm based in New York City. Uzair has, has conducted research on infrastructure projects proposed by Prime Minister Modi's government in India, and he regularly publishes on South and Central Asian politics and trade. Uh, 
to my immediate left is Farah Rafiq, who is president of Vizier Consulting LLC, a political risk advisory company focused on the Middle East and South Asia. Um, she's also a non-resident fellow at the New York, at excuse me, the Middle East Institute here in Washington, D.C. Arif previously worked for the Saving Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution, as well as in public relations. Um, Arif's scholarly work focuses on political reform, religious extremism, and terrorism in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India, as well as on great power politics in South Asia. Um, very relevant to today's discussion, he recently completed a grant-funded study on the economic, political, and strategic implications of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, to my right is Jun Sun, who is co-director of the East Asia Program and director of the China Program here at the Stenson Center. Her expertise is Chinese foreign policy, U.S.-China relations, and China's relations with neighboring countries and authoritarian regimes. Uh, previously, Yun was a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution, where she focused on China's national security decision-making processes and China-Africa relations. She's also served as the International Crisis Group's Beijing-based China analyst and has additional experience working on U.S.-Asia relations here in Washington, D.C. Uh, finally, to my far right is Shamila Chaudhry, who is senior advisor to Dean Bali Nasser at the School for Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. She's also a senior South Asian fellow at New America. She has extensive experience in South Asia, both in and out of government, uh, including from 2010 to 2011, when she served as director for Pakistan and Afghanistan on the National uh, Security Council. She previously worked on the Department of State's, um, excuse me, on the Department of State's policy planning staff, where she advised Secretary Clinton and the late Ambassador Dick Holbrook on Afghanistan and Pakistan, and she's held additional postings with both the State Department and with USAID. More recently, Shamila worked on Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Sri Lanka for the East Asia Group, uh, the Political Risk and Business Forum. So thanks very much to you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, and for the remarks, what we have um, planned this afternoon is kind of to start with a zoomed-in picture on what's happening right now in terms of macroeconomic issues in Pakistan, issues with GTEC, a lot of the new developments that we've seen um, even just in the last week, the Sumer with Rain out. Then we'll kind of zoom out a little bit, so we'll look more from a re regional standpoint, and then we'll help us um, think through issues on China and China's perspective and some of the kind of goals with, uh, with CTEC and in Pakistan. And then finally, Shamila can help us think through other regional implications, um, most notably India, um, how India views these developments, and then from a U.S. foreign policy standpoint as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Arif, who will get us started. And if you can all remember to just turn on your microphones, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth and, and Samir, for organizing this event uh, and inviting me to share my thoughts. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, so I'm going to provide a brief overview of Pakistan's uh, economy, where, uh, where it stands, what are the causes of uh, the present challenges, uh, propose some uh, pre potential remedies, and then uh, discuss the broader uh, political and strategic impacts, including potentially on CPEC. So all that within about eight minutes, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, so Pakistan's economy is on shaky ground. Uh, ba balance of payments crisis is looming, uh, despite a number of policy interventions over the past year, uh, including the influx of around $2 billion from China, uh, floating of the exchange rate. Uh, net foreign exchange reserves have uh, declined to $9 billion as of mid-September. So that's below uh, the threshold for covering three months of imports. Uh, and, <coughs> uh, and, you know, in August 2016, uh, the State Bank of Pakistan held $18.1 billion in net foreign exchange reserves. Uh, that was when Pakistan completed a three-year IMF program. So within two years' time, uh, the net foreign exchange reserves essentially halved. Uh, again, that's after several policy interventions. So uh, by comparison, uh, the State Bank of Bangladesh, or the, the Bank of Bangladesh, uh, has around $30 billion in foreign exchange reserves. So we have uh, you know, comparable countries, comparable economies, and, and vastly different um, you know, external situations, external account uh, situations. So uh, Pakistan's current account deficit just continues to, to widen. 
Uh, it was around 18, 15 billion dollars in the 2016 to 2017 fiscal year. Uh, the previous fiscal year it grew to 18 billion dollars, and in the current fiscal year, it's likely to widen to at least maybe 20 billion dollars or more. So this stems from a surge in imports that overlapped with a 33-month period in which exports experienced a net decline. So imports were growing, export, uh, sorry, uh, and exports were in decline over this, this large period. So the surge in imports uh, has been driven by two major factors. One is uh, the growing volume and cost of energy imports. Pakistan is a net energy importer, and fuel is the largest commodity import for Pakistan. Uh, it constitutes around 20 to 30 percent of, of Pakistan's imports, at least in terms of goods. Uh, <coughs> and uh, machinery imports have also grown uh, in recent years. Uh, these machinery, uh, this machinery has uh, been used for electric power and infrastructure projects. Some of, uh, much of which has been through CPEC, but not all. Uh, it's been through CPEC, and uh, the machinery imports have leveled off this year. But uh, as the price of oil uh, continues to rise, and with that. LNG, Pakistan has begun importing LNG and is pegged to Brent, uh, the import bill continues to balloon. So energy is a major contributor to this uh, disequilibrium in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan's, again, Pakistan's uh, top commodity, uh, imported commodity is energy, and compare that to Bangladesh, uh, its largest import uh, is uh, textile materials. So Pakistan essentially sells uh, more raw cotton than it does finished garments. Uh, it's at the lower end of the value chain. Bangladesh is not a major cotton producer, but it's the world's second largest exporter of garments, second only to China. Um, so energy is also a big part of why Pakistan's exports are not competitive. Electricity rates are around 30% cheaper in Bangladesh, uh, which has leveraged its domestic natural gas reserves uh, for its export-oriented uh, garment industry. Gas, natural gas, is about 50% cheaper in Bangladesh. Uh, the minimum wage is also uh, about half of uh, in Bangladesh, it's about half of that in Pakistan. Uh, garment exporters in Bangladesh are taxed at rates of around 12 to 15 percent, compared to 25 to 30 percent in Pakistan. Bangladesh also has a, a special police force for its uh, economic zones uh, to thwart uh, labor unrest. So my point is that you know public spending, uh, at least in terms of subsidies or security, in Bangladesh is oriented around um, you know, an industry that generates uh, foreign exchange. Uh, in, in Pakistan, public sub subsidies and public goods are oriented around uh, domestic consumption. So that's a, you know, a structural problem in, in the Pakistani economy, and it's a byproduct of decisions that policymakers there make. So Pakistan's problem with the current account is in many ways an energy problem. Um, so as a net energy importer and, and as a country that has um, comparatively expensive uh, energy and electric power rates, uh, its exports are less competitive. Uh, and so the country tends to find itself in a balance of payments crisis when oil prices rise. Pakistan needs around $9 billion to prevent a full-blown balance of payments crisis. Uh, total external financing needs uh, this uh, year may total, will likely total over $30 billion. So we'll probably see a current account deficit that um, uh, approaches $20 billion. And then there's, there's also $9.3 billion in terms of external debt servicing. Uh, public debt is also rising, and we can um, you know, get into the details a bit later. Uh, the budget deficit is also expanding. Uh, it's about, uh, at least um, you know, as of uh, the middle of this year, uh, it would be about 6.6% uh, of uh, GDP. Uh, the government is taking efforts, uh, taking measures to reduce that to around 5%, uh, but it's going to be a, you know, a very uh, tough task. Uh, there are also liabilities in the electricity and energy sector that exceed uh, $10 billion. So there's a liquidity problem in the energy sector. That's another structural issue that has, you know, um, taken a lot of attention in, in town here. Uh, you know, since uh, you know the 2000 post 2008 period, uh, and there hasn't been, uh, you know, decisive change in that regard. So uh, the new government has uh, proposed an amended budget aimed at reducing both the fiscal and, and current account deficits. Uh, it's def uh, deferred uh, major issues, major challenges like tax reform probably going to ta um, tackle those in the next budget. But the near-term impact is that uh, growth will slow. It will uh, likely be in the, the upper 4% range. Interest rates and inflation uh, will approach or exceed double digits, and the rupee could be devalued once again. So an IMF bailout looks uh, quite likely. 
the question for me seems to be what size uh, of a um, uh, bailout will Pakistan receive or ask for. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a certain threshold it may um, seek to avoid in which uh, it would have an extraordinary, extraordinary status and uh, be, you know, the target of um, more stiffer conditionality. Uh, and, um, and so it has a, a range of options it could do, it can pr potentially use to, to avoid that scenario. Uh, could attract more um, foreign direct investment. Uh, perhaps if uh, the markets uh, stabilize, if there's a perception that exchange rates will kind of uh, reach a, a, you know, a natural point, that um, uh, portfolio investors could return to the country. Uh, certain measures uh, such as you know, subsidizing um, natural gas for textile exporters could boost exports, and we could see you know, a couple billion dollars in terms of a net um, in the current account. Um, so as far as the decision in respect to the IMF, um, Pakistan will likely make a decision by the end of this month. The finance minister had said um, last week uh, that Pakistan will make a decision in mid-October, but you know, Pakistanis you know, have a bit of a challenge with uh, doing things on time, so we can just be a bit more liberal and, and say maybe by the end of the month. So... Um, <coughs> So uh, how will this impact uh, some, you know, uh, public sector uh, development, Pakistan's public sector development program, and more specifically, uh, the China-Pakistan economic corridor? Uh, I think as, you know, we all, you know, most observers have clearly realized, uh, this will probably be a, a slow year for CPEC. You have a new government in power. Uh, it has to acclimate itself um, to, um, you know, developing, uh, to, you know, holding power. It has to develop a policy framework. Uh, and it has, um, you know, more immediate priorities in terms of stabilizing the macroeconomic situation. But at the same time, you know, this is a government that has a markedly different approach, at least notionally, in terms of what its uh, uh, allocation uh, should be or what spending priorities should be. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, they will reassess CPEC and, um, you know, instead of making it a supply-side driven program, uh, look uh, to make it something that addresses actual uh, demand both in, in the country and, and in, region in, terms of, in the region in terms of uh, transshipment and, uh, and energy and all that. So I think, you know, large-scale projects like, um, you know, the, uh, there's a, a railroad, uh, the main railroad line that connects Karachi to Peshawar will uh, likely, um, you know, be deferred, uh, the, you know, the realignment of that. Um, you know, we could see, um, you know, China maybe uh, take steps to either um, restructure or reprofile some CPEC-related debt. Uh, they should uh, try to renegotiate some of these uh, power agreements. Um, but, uh, you know, the big challenge is stabilizing the economy, and I think uh, there's a, you know, a, a challenge in terms of, um, you know, staying committed to CPEC, um, uh, you know, not showing a sort of um, uh, negative, um, uh, not, uh, sort of, you know, Avoiding negative signaling uh, with respect to the China-Pakistan relationship, uh, which is the target of you know great um, international scrutiny, um, but at the same time, you know, it's a country that has uh, some real fiscal challenges, and I think um, it's going to have to kind of figure out uh, in a very public way uh, how to address um, some of these, um, you know, CPEC, which is largely, I think, uh, embellished some of Pakistan's structural flaws. It's you know many of the electric power projects are, are quite expensive, uh, and it's contributed to this um, widening of the current account. So CPEC has to kind of become a bit of a transformative uh, uh, framework. It actually needs a set of ideas that kind of govern it and, and then um, you know, impact how um, uh, Pakistan spends or, or borrows. Uh, and so you know, that's going to take some time. So I think you know, the next year or so, uh, you know, we're going to see a bit of slowing of uh, the implementation and conception of CPEC, and you know there are these attempts to kind of multi multilateralize it, but you know that will also take some time. But uh, you know I think uh, just going back to the issue of Pakistan's economy, um, you know I would say you know you know a lot of I think there's been a lot of focus on um, uh, taxation um, and and the weakness of exports, but you know energy seems to me to be uh, you know a common issue both in terms of making exports uncompetitive, and then also uh, expanding, um, you know, um, having a, you know, a current, being quite vulnerable to fluctuations in, 
uh, in uh, global commodity prices. So, you know, so that's something maybe we can discuss in the Q and A. But um, that's just you know kind of my food for thought. A bit uh, maybe uh, unconventional in terms of how we look at Foxman's economy, but I kind of just uh, thought it'd be worthwhile to start that way. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Arif. Really um, appreciate those insights and remarks, um, and certainly a lot to consider. Um, next, is there? Yeah. Um, the thank you, uh, and thanks, Elizabeth, Samir, for organizing this. Um, I'll sort of take a step back, and you know what Arif described are really challenges that the Pakistan economy is facing and challenges that we saw coming about 18, 24 months ago um, towards the tail end of the Nawaz Sharif administration. But the larger question that I think we need to ask ourselves is, why is it that Pakistan's economy kind of feels like Groundhog Day? I was talking to my friend yesterday, last night, preparing for this talk, and he said, this kind of feels like Groundhog Day time and time again. And I, I said, I agree with you. But why is that? Um, why is it that there are 18 plus IMF programs, only one of which, which was successfully completed by Pakistan, but time after time again, every four to five years, there's another talk of another IMF program. And I think the reason for this is that at its core, Pakistan's economy is a rent-seeking extractive state that is both rent-seeking externally with outside powers, geopol takes advantage of its geo geopolitical location and, and, and uh, its interests, and internally, where an elite extracts wealth out of it, the masses in a way that, um, frankly, no other country in South Asia does. Um, and at that core of that rent-seeking state are the three Bs, as I would describe it. The interest of the boots, the interest of the bureaucrats, and the interest of the businessmen. And within those businessmen, I would say some of you might be thinking, well, what about the agricultural feudal elite? They're part of that business group. Um, so what you have is that the structural flaw in the system that when you have an IMF program, the elites are fine with what happens. It's the poor man and the poor citizen of the country that suffers. So time after time, again, there is no incentive for the elites to make the tough policy choices that fix this Groundhog Day problem. So, and Samir mentioned at the start of this talk, you know, 1% of Pakistanis pay income taxes, and 53% of them say, and according to Gallup, that the taxation is unfair. I actually say, like, people talk about taxation in Pakistan as if it's a problem. Fundamentally, every Pakistani pay, pays taxes. It's just that the taxation system is aggressive and extractive in nature. So when you buy your cell phone card in Pakistan, you pay, used to pay at least until the Supreme Court turned it off, 40% uh, withholding tax. You pay 40%, 50% taxes in the form of surcharges and television fees and power plant surcharges for your electricity bill. So you've had, in, at, even if you look at it from the taxation perspective in the last five years, a doubling of tax revenue under the Nawaz Sharif government, primarily through the extractive, regressive taxation regime in the country, which has been expanded under every IMF program. And when you look at every IMF program, you will, uh, going back to the 90s at least, the issues that the IMF explains are time and time again to the sentence exactly the same, but they don't get solved. And they don't get solved because there's been a failure to invest in sustainable growth in the country, a failure of imagination, a failure to think out of the box about what this country can do. Arif talked about textile exports and the fact that Pakistan exports more cotton than finished garments. Um, I say there's only so many towels and bed sheets you can sell to the world. You gotta sell something else as well. Like what is it that Pakistan can sell? We don't know. And so we end up in this situation where industries that are uncompetitive by any stretch of the imagination, let's look at the auto, auto manufacturing industry in Pakistan, wholly uncompetitive, continue to be protected by these business elite interests that do not allow structural reform of the system. And to make problems even worse, the policy is always behind the curve. So when you look back, as Arif talked about, the energy sector challenges, in the 90s, everyone will tell you the IPP policy was flawed under the Bhutto regime. And it fundamentally hollowed out Pakistan's economy because energy costs were too high. Well, in the last five years, we've had an energy policy regime reliant on imported coal. At a time when the rest of the world is running away from coal, including China, Pakistan has gone and generated about 30% of an its energy mix coming from coal. And those coal plants are not even located on the coastal line where the imported coal is brought in. They're shipped all the way into Sahiwal uh, through the agricultural belt of the country where no one th thought about coal dust problems or anything like that in the Punjab where November through January, 
you end up with toxic air, both on the Indian side of the Punjab and on the Pakistani side of the Punjab, but there are no more coal power plants in the country. And so without resolving those structural issues, you cannot have an economy that is competitive, that is sustainable, that can grow and become stronger. And the data that I want to share with you, I think, to showcase the sort of the slide of the Pakistan economy is its productivity, labor productivity levels. If you look at labor productivity in Pakistan in the 1980s, it grew by about 4.2% per annum, at a time when Pakistan's economy was considered a success story. 90s, it dropped to 1.8% per year. 2000 to 2015, it was 1.3% per year. And if you look at it since 2007, if you sort of, uh, you know, this century's, uh, the last eight years or so, um, it's about 1% per annum. In that same period in India since 2000, a country right across the border, next door, 5% per annum growth in total productivity. And so you run into this problem that you're not competitive, there's nothing to grow the economy sustainably, so you end up in a debt trap, you end up in an IMF program, you end up being unable to sell anything to the rest of the world. And I think even now with the PTI and its Naya Pakistan agenda, there is nothing really that talks about structural reforms of the economy that make it competitive. So the last government had a Vision 2025 plan. We, the aspiration was to boost um, exports to about $150 billion a, a year. I was just like, I laughed at it when I looked at that figure. And I asked uh, the then planning minister, S. N. Iqbal, what the government was doing to achieve this goal. And his answer was, well, we're investing in power plants. Power plants don't just give you um, the competitiveness to have exports of hundreds. What, what are your investments in total factor productivity? None. And so one third of the workforce remains illiterate in Pakistan. 40% have under 10 years of schooling. You cannot compete in a 21st century uh, globalized marketplace with, with that kind of uh, imbalance in your workforce. And, and those investments have to be made in Pakistan. I was talking to a friend of mine who has a textile export business in Karachi, and she said that they used to lose orders because of uncompetitiveness on the energy side. And that uncompetitiveness still remains. But now they have an issue where their labor that they hire cannot, they have to spend a lot of money training them to stitch the modern uh, garments that are needed because the fits have changed. The fits are much more, um, require some math, basic understanding of math because the shapes are different. It is no longer the box t-shirt or the box jeans anymore, right? You don't get those at H&M anymore. And so she cannot compete because once she adds the high energy cost, which is about 12 to 13 cents per kilowatt hour, RF, right? Um, you add that on top of that, add about 20, 25,000 rupees a year on training of your workforce to make them competitive so they can stitch the garments. It's, it's uncompetitive. And so the current government, what it's done, which is about a 2.1% um, fiscal adjustment um, in terms of cutting um, uh, the deficit is is like telling a household, and I, I said it at another event with Shamir uh, uh, the, a couple of weeks ago, it's like asking a family to take out your children from school and not pay for health care while the head of the household gets to spend on their new toys. And I think all of you here know what the head of the household is and what the toys are in Pakistan. Um, until and unless... <laughs> You know, uh, until and unless there's that conversation about what is it that the country's spending its money on and what is it that it needs to spend its money on, we will be here three, four years down the road talking about another IMF program. And I think my hope from this government is that it invests in education and skills development and fundamentally tackles the very structural interests at the heart of this rent-seeking extractive state. Because if it doesn't, CPEC or no CPEC, Saudi Arabia bailout or no Saudi Arabian bailout, this economy is not going to go anywhere. And, and we can talk about what some of the solutions are, but um, I'll, I'll just stop there for now. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Uzair. And definitely want to uh, follow up in the Q&A on what some of the potential solutions would be. But thanks so much for uh, highlighting those issues. Uh, next, we'll go to Jean for her thoughts on how China views the coal situation. Um, and Thank you, Elizabeth, and I really, I really enjoyed Wazar and uh, RF's comments. They're so, so it's so sobering, mm -hmm. and I think if there's anything to say about China's perception, China's presence in Pakistan, I think the Chinese have been very much sobered at this point um, as for what uh, what kind of challenge that they are they are faced with. 
Before we talk about CPAC, I think there's a, there's a, there's a question that needs to be answered as to well, why is this so important for Taiwan. And I think there are primarily two reasons. Of course, on one hand, there's a strategic consideration on China's part that Pakistan is seen as China's pivotal state in the sub-region of South Asia. So that's, that's China's pivot. So when you look at China's policy towards Pakistan and China's policy towards India, we say they're the two sides of the same coin that the support lended to, um, offered to Pakistan is the counterbalance or the balance to, um, to India. And of course, um, there has been debate in China as for which country should be the priority of China's South Asia policy, that if China treats India better or with more, with more friendliness, maybe that will determine the nature or set the course of, uh, of, of China's policy towards South Asia. But the, I would say that to settle this, this debate, eventually people still come to the conclusion that, um, that China needs to seek a, a friendly relationship or better relationship with, with Pakistan in order to check and balance in India. But on the other hand, that China also needs to seek a friendly relationship with India in order to prevent India uh, from seeking alliance or alignment with the, with the United States. So we've, we've talked about this, this, um, this sort of three layers of China's policy towards South Asia here at Simpson before. So basically within South Asia, within the sub-region, China supports Pakistan, China supports other countries in South Asia in order to counterbalance what the Chinese perceive as a regional hege hegemony of, uh, of India. Then within the Asia region, that China tries to pull India closer in order to prevent a India-US alliance or alignment in the region. So on a global level, China seeks alignment or seeks uh, cooperation with India in order to counterbalance the global north, both as a, a leader or member of the emerging power or the uh, developing country bloc. So that's a strategic level consideration. But then specifically coming to China's vision for Pakistan's future, the hope that China has is to build Pakistan or to help Pakistan become a, what they call the 3M country, 3M. So 3M stands for modern, Muslim, and moderate. And because of the challenges that Pakistan has encountered in recent years, politically, economically, <coughs> strategically, in terms of the security, so for China, if Pakistan remains a fragile state, and if the country becomes destabilized, then for everything that China has planned for the region, including its regional strategy, including its future of uh, um, Sino-Pakistan relation, Pakistan will only be a liability. And the more destabilized it is, the bigger liability it is for China. And that alone, there is also the national security, the homeland security concern that China has in terms of the Xinjiang and the Uyghur issue. So if Pakistan remains a liability for China, then the support Pakistan can lend to China's strategic vision is really going to be limited. Therefore, for the Chinese government, uh, how to achieve or to help Pakistan to achieve its political stability and economic stabilization is really the priority. And the answer that um, I agree with RF that CPAC is seen as a transformative effort in, in Pakistan. And I would say that view is not only prevalent in Pakistan, but it's also prevalent in the Chinese policy community when they think about what CPAC is really trying to do uh, in Pakistan. So looking at the, at, at, on the surface, it seems that CPAC is really just a huge liability or huge debt accumulation for Pakistan. But if you look at the specific projects of what China is trying to do, I would say there is more depth to, to the strategic consideration. And I fully agree with Wazar in terms of the, uh, the, the whole basket of challenges that um, in, in Pakistan, systematically, politically, and uh, elite politics, and the business environment, and the labor issues. But you have to start somewhere. And for the Chinese, when they look at Pakistan, the design of the CPAC is, uh, is primarily focused on the infrastructure of the country. And I would say that it's focused on the most uh, basic capacity building of the national economy. And if you look at the, uh, uh, the design of CPAC, so energy and the power projects are seen as the priority area for the, uh, for the CPAC. And in terms of the scale of the investment, energy and power basically um, occupies about 70% of CPAC. And the other 30% 30, 30 is, uh, is reserved for mostly transportation infrastructure. So there are various reports and discussions about, about CPAC. First of all, there does not seem to be one number to, to describe that how big the, uh, the financial pledges 
plaques really is. So from the very beginning, I think it was uh, somewhere around 46 billion US dollars. But now the more, the more popular number that we see is somewhere 62 billion or 64 billion, so, so much bigger than the original report. But in the Chinese narrative, the one thing that is consistent, that has been consistent since 2014, 2015, is the total number of projects. And that number has been 22, including five hydropower projects, four fire, uh, fire power plants, uh, four wind farm, four, um, four contracting service, four, uh, I'm sorry, another three is the uh, irrigation and the water project and one port, uh, one port project and one, high, one highway. So that 22 number has been relatively consistent in the Chinese narrative. And the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi just visited Pakistan earlier this month, and in his statements, this 22 pro cooperation projects, according to him, nine has been completed and uh, 13 is still under construction. And the total volume of the investment is 19 billion US dollars. So of course, he also uh, added other very positive numbers, like 2% contribution to the GDP growth of Pakistan and something like a 70,000 job opportunities that, that has come out of this, uh, this project. So apparently for, for Chinese government, for Wang Yi, most specifically for his visit to Pakistan this time, the issue of debt is the very emphasis, the very priority that he was focusing on. So he specifically pointed out, well, this is a Chinese government rhetoric, I should actually point that out. Within these 22 projects, 18 of them are based on direct investment or the aid from, uh, from, from Chinese, from chi the Chinese side. And only four of them uses the, the concessional loan from the, from the Chinese, um, Chinese side. Then according to a report that um, Pakistani finance, uh, finance minister delivered the data to the, to the parliament earlier this month, among the about 69 billion US dollars of foreign debt that Pakistan currently has, Beijing, China uh, occupies around 8.4 billion US dollars. And within that 8.4, about 66 billion US dollars is um, concessional loans or loans for the CPAC project. So what does this number, the Chinese number and the Pakistani number add up to? What, what do they mean? I think the first thing is that, yes, China is making a pretty significant financial contribution into Pakistani economy. However, the total number is not as high as the um, as the media or the original report had, uh, had, had proclaimed. So we know that the uh, disbursement of the Chinese financing is really made step by step. So it's not a one-time disbursement that completely goes into the project. So which means that for this uh, 19 billion US dollars of total investment that Wang Yi, foreign minister, was talking about, not all these investments are dispersed. So even if it is completely dispersed, the total input that China has put into the CPAC is 19 plus six, so that's uh, something around 25 billion US dollars. So that's around half of the uh, original financial pledges um, from all the media reports since, since day one. And it's pretty much in, uh, uh, aligned with the conversation that we have had with the Chinese uh, policy analysts that about 50% is, uh, is dispersed at this point. And whether the other 50% will be dispersed and how soon that will be dispersed is another question. So I think that's the, first, uh, that's the first point that these data really illustrate. I think the second issue that the data really illustrate is that when we look at China's financial pledges and input into Pakistan, not everything is limited to CPAC. So CPAC has a lot of the loans and investment towards infrastructure, but if we look at other type of financial pledges or the financial contribution that China has made into Pakistan, there seems to be a quite significant chunk of, uh, of, of money as well. So for example, according to the report by Reuters, the first ten, during the first 10 months of the current fiscal year, China provided 1.5 billion US dollars of bilateral loans to Pakistan. And at the same time, Pakistan also received around 3 billion US dollars of commercial loans. And most of these loans are from Chinese, uh, from Chinese banks. And we know that uh, most of these Chinese banks are not Federally owned either. Um, so before the current fiscal year in 2016, China provided 900 million uh, US dollars to Pakistan as a loan. And then um, in the first three months of 2017, China also provided 300 million US dollars as a bilateral loan. So these 
$1.2 billion US dollars of financial uh, support that China provided to Pakistan is divided equally between CBD, China Development, uh, Development Bank, and ICBC. So both are uh, not policy banks. Well, CBD is a policy bank, but ICBC is, is more of a mix. But it is believed that the Chinese banks were at least operating under the auspices of the Chinese government to provide these loans to, to the Pakistani government. So that's what the data is, uh, is, is telling us. I think now the key question is um, whether the, the investment or the concession loans associated with CPAC is going to affect Pakistan's ability to seek uh, loans from IMF. I think here there are a couple of factors that determine China's position. So of course when, this new, uh, when the media, media reports first came out in, in July, the, um, the narrative that we hear is that if Pakistan wants to seek this loan from IMF, it's going to affect the implementation <coughs> or the advancement of, of CPAC. There's going to be a negative influence for, uh, for, for CPAC. And it's, uh, I wouldn't say this is a, this is a um, strange or, or new perspective because uh, I think China in the past has had experience with, uh, with similar situation. Like in 2009, 2010, when China was doing the resources for infrastructure projects in DRC, uh, IMF was concerned about the debt sustainability of the country, and as a result, China had to cut the size of the, uh, uh, of the project in, in DRC. So if the same example is going to repeat itself, then there is going to be a, an impact, to say the least. But, um, it, but it also depends on the details and the negotiation. I think the second factor for China or for Pakistan is that to what extent the U.S. will be strongly object or reject the uh, Pakistan's um, application for this IMF loan. Mm -hmm. So U.S. decision seems to be not only related to CPAC or to the economic decision making or the economic policies of Pakistan, but it's all relate related to the security policy, Pakistan's policy towards Afghanistan. So there's a much broader frame of uh, broader frame of issues. Um, that's being being discussed here. So whether CPAC really forms a significant or the, the deal breaker for the uh, IMF loan, I think that's another question. So the third question is uh, that, say, the worst comes to the worst, will China pick it up? Does China have a choice? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a more interesting question as a, as a China analyst, that that's a more interesting question because um, I, I particularly um, um, appreciate Samir's argument coming to CPAC that, yes, on one hand, it is a bad, uh, you could argue it, it creates that that problem for uh, for Pakistan. But that trap and lending trap, they're the two sides of the same coin, right? And the more China contributes into Pakistan, the less able China will be able to, the less able China can afford Pakistan to, to fail. So if China has enough stake in Pakistan that it decides that no matter what, China needs to prevent this state from, from failing, then, and Pakistan is too important for China to, to fail, then I think China will make a decision to, um, to come to Pakistan's rescue if, if it is needed. But from the Chinese perspective, I think the Chinese are also have their complaints and grievances about this, uh, what they, what they perceive as unex unrealistic expectations from the Pakistani government and from the Pakistani community about China always being there and China willing to pick it up whenever Pakistan needs them to. And I think the implication of that grievance or of that complaint is that China is also becoming more picky or stringent coming to their conditions. Like in, in terms of some of the um, the power plant that China has built or is building in Pakistan, if you look at the payment terms, look at the, um, the requirement that China has, has put into place for Pakistan to be able to pay China for the power generated. I think there is an element of social engineering coming to China's policy towards, uh, to, towards Pakistan. And of course, China also wants to unite in other investors in Pakistan in order to diversify the risk. And I think ADB, AIB, they were all there, um, both seen as um, as uh, as possible partners. And actually, there have been uh, cooperation between China and these multilateral banks, uh, multilateral development banks, in terms of projects in uh, in, in Pakistan. And last but not least, the uh, 
Saudi Arabia's joining the CPAC more recently is regarded as a very positive development for, for the Chinese side, that um, China is now the only country who is standing by Pakistan, and other, other countries also have their stake on the ground. So I'll stop there and look forward to discussion. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lin. Um, I think it's really helpful. Very often the conversation seems to <coughs> center on Pakistan, uh, but it's really helpful to hear the Chinese perspective on these issues and how these work to engage in. Um, so, Shemaya, last but not least. Thank you. Um, my friend here has done my homework for me. She said, uh, or done my work for me, actually. Thank <laughs> you. She said, Pakistan is too important to fail, so we must bail it out. Does that sound familiar to <laughs> anyone? <laughs> I mean, I think the last <laughs> 10 minutes of what you said, I could probably just repeat it and replace the United States in it. And this was, this was actually like one of the worries slash kind of ideas that was going around kind of the minds of in conversations of US policymakers that um, you know we were looking at the Chinese and the prospect of this huge investment <coughs> in Pakistan as both an opportunity but also a curse, right? Uh, both for the Chinese but also for the international community, which from time to time when Pakistan goes through these economic crises, will kind of converge to figure out how do we help them this time around? Because it's an, not in anyone's interest to have Pakistan fail economically, right? So as I was preparing for this presentation, I kind of was writing, I was being very logical about it, and then I realized that there are these kind of tropes that were guiding my thinking that I just forgot to even question anymore. And one of them was Pakistan's economic, economic stability is important to the international community. It's vital, right? That's something we tell ourselves. We, it's just, it's like common knowledge now, but we don't unpack it anymore. What does that mean? And that's what I, what I really liked about the question that I've been asked to address are, you know, it's what are the implications of Pakistan's economic challenges on US interests? Well, to answer that, to answer if the Pakistan economy is important to us, we have to think about what the US, or not us, because I'm not part of the US government anymore, <laughs> I can only speak for myself, but to what's important to the United States in Pakistan with regards to the economy, we have to look at just what the basic priorities are there and how much are those basic priorities even related to the economy, okay? We're gonna, be, we're gonna go big picture and then we're gonna go even bigger, okay? Because I think that there's, we, we've got a lot of the background now, but I think moving forward, there's gonna be a lot of questions that we're gonna have to ask that it's gonna take time because Pakistan is in transition, the region is in transition, and so is the United States. So let's start with um, the vision laid out by Imran Khan. It's huge. He wants to create an Islamic welfare state. When I hear that, I think expensive. When I hear welfare state, okay? I'm not even thinking about what does an Islamic welfare state look like. I'm just thinking welfare state given the state of tax collection in Pakistan. That just sounds impossible to me, right? He's really only gonna be able to do a couple of things in whatever time he has. The US vision of Pakistan and strategy towards Pakistan on the flip side is much more limited in scope. If we look at what the strategy laid out by Donald Trump was when he announced it, the, you know, in several months ago now, it's very limited. I don't even know that he mentioned economic engagement in it, right? It was very much focused on Afghanistan and security and getting what the US needs to get out of the situation and not being kind of tricked by this like duplicitous partner, okay? So those are the, that's what we have to work from. Those are the values as, iter you know, as reiterated by the president and expressed in the policy. Um, now, the history behind that is something that Uzair mentioned, which I think is really important. That's another foundational, it's like a, a piece of the foundation for our analysis, which is Pakistan is a rent-seeking state. And that is how it's set up by design. And the US has been a very much active participant in that, right? So now that the US is transitioning out of uh, that dynamic with Pakistan, how does it deal with these, you know, periods of economic instability that Pakistan has had in the past, right? If its own behavior is shifting, but then the old behaviors are repeating themselves in Pakistan, what do you do? What questions do you ask of yourself? So I'm just, I'm putting that out there as just, it's, we have to have it kind of in the background. And then finally, like something in the background that you, we always have to remember is, Whatever the US does on Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis the economy sends signals to the outside world. Whatever the US says to the IMF, what the IMF says about Pakistan says, sends signals to the market, right? All of the kind of capital that's out there, the investments, et cetera, 
there everyone is watching to see if this is a go or no go right and it's of course it's not like high on the list of like financiers i mean it's it's you know there's a very small community for this sort of thing but they are watching okay and then even development partners are watching because this up, this impacts them and i'll get into that a little bit um, but i, I want to make two big points and then I'll go into kind of what the actual US interests are and I've kind of laid this out as if I were writing a memo if I was in the US government answering this question. But of course it's in the US interest that Pakistan be economically stable, both short and long term. If not, these, these periodic economic crises will pull the United States back into this kind of rent seeking relationship orbit that it's actually trying to extract itself from does not want to be the lender of first, middle, and last resort when there's a crisis every five or six years, right? Um, and especially if the two countries keep finding themselves on opposite sides on the biggest issues between them, which are Afghanistan or the relationship with India or just broader national security issues. Um, and I hate to say it all goes back to Afghanistan because I know that there's a much bigger story out there to be told, but that's how the relationship is defined now. If you look at the strategy, it's really based on that. So we have to be very pragmatic about it. And I actually think an economically stable Pakistan means that the United States and Pakistan can have a more normal relationship with each other, because especially when it comes to Afghanistan, but other issues, because it's not based on this separate kind of um, relationship of bailing each other out you know, should some, should a crisis come along every five years, right? So that's just like a basic relationship dynamic, I think. So you could argue that U.S. assistance is actually preventing Pakistan from, you know, making these tough economic decisions in some ways, because the U.S. has always been there. All right, second big point I want to make, and I just want to acknowledge that Foreign Minister um, Shah Mahmood Qureshi actually said, um, he talked about self-sufficiency in reaction to kind of the U.S., um, withholding certain assistance recently. And I think this is a really interesting kind of theme that he just kind of threw out there. So he's only talking about it in the context of the United States. We're not talking about it in the context of Saudi Arabia or China or anyone else, right? So this is a very interesting theme that I think is, we'll see if it has any legs, but um, I'm not very optimistic, but I do think that the self-sufficiency issue is like at the core of this discussion because there's also another trope that we kind of have, out, you know, we've told ourselves, which is, well, if Pakistan wasn't so dependent on foreign aid, it could actually do what it wanted, and what it wants to, and it could take care of its people, and it could it wouldn't be beholden to these conditions and um, kind of requirements set on it by the loans and the grants and the development aid that it has, right? So that, I think that'll be kind of an interesting theme to explore as we see what the Khan government kind of focuses on, how their priorities unfold, okay? So um, I'm gonna focus mostly, you'll, you'll see it'll be focused mostly on national security issues and and, politics, but that's not to suggest that um, economic and business affairs aren't important. There is um, a community you know, within kind of the U.S. that focuses on these issues and they do really good work, but that's just not rising to the top at this point based on how the, the, the strategy is defined by the U.S. government. Okay, so let's go through some of these um, themes and I'll do, it, I'll, I'll do it really quickly. Okay, so the first big interest I would say if I was asked this and I was working at the White House again is we want an economically stable Pakistan because we want a stable partner that can facilitate the war in Afghanistan, right? We don't want a country in economic chaos that's supposed to help us facilitate the movement of material um, or any other kind of logistics that you know, we, we rely on them for because, you know, because we need them to kind of have the political space to maneuver in to deal with these contentious issues. And the more kind of Pakistan gets pulled into this economic chaos, the less they're able to work on any other issues, especially foreign policy issues and regional issues. They're just too, I mean, the, it's just a no-go zone, right? And it's just too complicated, especially when you have such a weak kind of coalition government um, dynamic. I think it's even harder to negotiate those things. Um, so the question for the US would be, if Pakistan's economy collapses, which it won't, or if it goes into a balance of payments crisis, can we still get our material through the routes that we're using in Pakistan, into Afghanistan? can we get the Pakistanis to collaborate with us in the ways that we envision on reconciliation? Does economic chaos actually impact their ability to kind of help us in X, Y, and Z on these national security issues? I, don't, I think that those things are really far apart. I'm not even sure that that's a realistic question to ask, but that's what I think we need to be thinking about if we're looking at what the US cares about and these economic challenges. I would say that 
in general, like the, this relationship persists despite the economic challenges and despite the political challenges. I think it's shown itself for that. And I wanted to make the point earlier that um, when I started first working um, on the Pakistan death, it was at the kind of tail end of the Musharraf administration, or Musharraf government and the Bush administration. And there was very little aid um, in general. It was all kind of, you know, it was coalition support funds and security focus. And the economic aid came after, right? And the investment in Pakistan's economy and people came after. <coughs> it was a reflection of US values or of US priorities in the policy. So you wanna follow that, right? And that's, I mean, I think that answers the question. And now we're at the opposite. The levels of US assistance are actually lower <laughs> than they were in 2001. It's never been this low, right? So, I mean, I think that kind of, that, that tells us exactly where we're at. Um, okay. So the other, the other kind of issue when it comes to having a stable Pakistan or stable partner is that the United States doesn't want to be the only one invested in the stability of Pakistan. It can't be the only one, especially because the, uh, the level of assistance and the kind of engagement is in transformation. So it actually needs the IMF, right? It needs development partners because it knows it's going to be able to fu function less and less as this like you know, lender of first, middle, and last resort, right? And the irony here is that the coalition support funds from the United States, they no longer really exist. They've been actually used as a line item in the national budget in Pakistan. They've come to depend on those. And I, I'm not suggesting that those funds were what got the country through the economic crises. By all means, they were not. Um, and there's small amount in the larger scheme of things, but it's just another example of diminishing kind of lines of revenue or streams of revenue that the government kind of had in the past when they periodically came into this balance of payments crisis. Okay, so the, there's the second interest is based on this idea, or it's preserving the civilian government or making sure there's a strong civilian government in Pakistan. And it's based on this idea that economic stability prevents coups from happening. Because in the past, throughout Pakistan's history, Coups have, t they tend to happen when the country is in some kind of balance of payments crisis. There's some really scary, interesting research done on it. And <laughs> it's not that they're related. We, we Jared and I, we talked about this at our event a couple weeks ago. It's used, economic instability is used as an excuse uh, when there are other constitutional political crises happening in Pakistan. So it's a, it's a way for the military to maneuver quickly against a weak, poorly performing civilian government, right? But the US and also India, because we're talking about the kind of the regional interests as well, and others will watch this, right? If the civilians are not doing their job, first and foremost, which is stabilizing the economy, then the military is always waiting kind of in the wings. Ask any Pakistani and they'll tell you this. So I don't think that this is just an American or Indian perspective. It's just, you know, it, it is the state of play there. And so we want to, I, I think the, the US will want to watch that carefully, right, when there's questions about economic stability. And I don't think saying that Imran Khan is supported by the military is enough to like defuse this threat, right? So that's just, you gotta think about it. Um, you talked a lot about China already, so I don't wanna get too much into that, but I do think another US interest with regards to Pakistan's economy is um, <coughs> containing China slash keeping an eye on China, question mark. I, <laughs> I don't think, we, um, yeah, I don't think we've, um, they've quite figured it out. It's a combination of all of the above. Um, China can definitely be helpful, helpful on certain US interests related to security, but as you mentioned, that's changing and China's own kind of foreign policy engagements are in flux. Um, and I do think CPEC has hypothetically created some breathing room for the United States to kind of draw down certain kinds of assistance, but it needs to be, I think it still needs to be watchful of how intertwined the economy becomes with Chinese investments. And um, for the obvious reasons, like China in like w with its relationship with India and also what it's done in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, but also because of, um, I mean, we, we don't know how these kind of predatory lending practices will manifest over time and what kind of political dynamics they might lead to internally in Pakistan, right? It could be, I mean, it's already been very kind of destabilizing in terms of domestic political relationships, um, patronage, all of that, right? And I don't think we know it enough to actually have too many concrete examples, but we don't wanna get into like another repetitive cycle with balance of payments and then the CPEC is just another big factor there. Whereas in the past it was like high oil payments, for example. So, um, and then finally, like the other risk related to, um, you know, 
China and Pakistan and for the US would be kind of on the political culture angle is something that I've heard a lot about from media and civil society in Pakistan um, who basically say that, you know, with, with kind of, with donors come values. And when the US was the biggest donor in town, the US would, you know, likes to get involved in certain issues and wants to have a say on certain things, not even related to the assistance. China is no different, right? And so there's a view that, you know, if the Chinese are th the biggest partner and they're working closely with the military as they have been, that that will shape how the Pakistani military or the government treats its media or its political opponents and how it deals with insurgencies, right? So there's this fear of kind of the Chinese way becoming part of the Pakistani way, right? And I think this is a little bit more of like this amorphous kind of challenge, but I think it's worth thinking about because that's all I hear now from um, journalists and other thinkers. And it's also kind of seeping into kind of the mindset of other kind of parts of society. There was this article I read today about Samuel Huck, the, the cleric who is basically saying like, this is a trap, you know, we're gonna, this is a debt trap for the Chinese, and it's. I just thought that was, was like, what world am I in? <laughs> it's like an episode of Black Mirror, my whole life. <laughs> um, okay, so that, um, and now I'm gonna be in trouble with the Chinese for saying that, but that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, really quick, because I know we want to get to discussion, but I think security and counterterrorism obviously are big priorities for the United States and Pakistan. I think that there's this idea out there that if Pakistan was just economically successful, there would be no terrorism. Mm. There would be no militants, there would be no madrasas, and that you know everything would be a lot better. Like, let's get rid of that idea, because that doesn't exist, right? So, but I do think that um, there's, an, you know, the question of does economic chaos create a more favorable environment for extremism? There's something in there to think about, right? There's something in there to think about. There, we are in a place now where the youth bulge in Pakistan is so large that we're actually seeing it manifest politically. Imran Khan is the po one of the manifestations of the youth bulge. They made him prime minister, essentially, with the help of some other friends, of course. But <laughs> so what could happen in an economic crisis this time around, different than 10 years ago, now that you have this huge population with, which has very high expectations of their kind of, you know, this fan favorite who's become a politician, right? So I think that's, that's really the question is about street kind of the street game and what happens on the street rather than terrorism and extremism we need to get away from that um promoting business and commercial affairs that's a really i mean it's a low priority i think for the u.s when it comes to pakistan's economy there is a trade relationship um you know it's i don't, wouldn't say it's the, the you could call it strong i guess it's not quite large but it's there and um but will Pakistan's economic challenges affect bilateral trade ties? I think that's very kind of, there's minimal impact there. Um, the biggest kind of, you know, there's a big consumer products market that would be, I mean, but again, there are challenges to like actually working in Pakistan, American businesses have had. So I just, I don't think that's gonna be kind of high on the list. Um, there'll be some interesting kind of questions about how does economic instability in Pakistan affect development programs? So from donors, not just the US, but others. Um, it, it actually like increases the burden, the burden of development programs essentially because you're they're picking up kind of where the, the state has kind of left off, and so there will be and, and w at, at a time when the U.S. is doing less and um, a lot of countries are doing less. What does that imply? I mean, I think that will hurt socioeconomic indicators over a long period of time. Um, and I think. I, you know, I'll, I'll leave, I'll end on kind of just a quick India note. I said that you know, I think India is mostly in the same kind of category as the United States where it's thinking about kind of, you know, economic instability in the big picture. They don't, I mean, they're not obviously going to get involved in helping Pakistan stabilize its economy, but they don't want a basket case on its border, right? They just don't. They can't afford it. And I think that sentiment was what guided a lot of the, um, conversations with Manmohan Singh, um, but that time period has passed, and we're now dealing with Modi and elections, and also elections in Afghanistan, and there's just too much political transition in the region, I think, for any kind of political leadership to take to take on kind of some kind of regional economic integration approach, or even just basic India-Pakistan rapprochement, which, I mean, we saw that in practice when um, Imran Khan's 
letter was rebuffed by the Indians. So um, I just, I, I hate to be a pessimist on that, but I just, I don't really see anything. I would love to see any, something new, but I just don't see anything. So I'll leave it at that. Fantastic, and thank you so much. Um, and just to uh, ask a quick question to get our discussion going before we open it up to the audience, I actually wanted to pick up on the theme that you were mentioning in terms of these parallels that seem to have emerged between what was once the US strategy in Pakistan and sort of increasingly the position that China is finding itself in in some ways. Um, um, you, you mentioned the three M's, and I was thinking back to you know, peaceful and prosperous Pakistan, which was always something and still is uh, that the US was interested in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all about the alliteration. Um, and I just wonder, reflecting a little bit on the experience that the US has had in its relationship with Pakistan um, over the past couple of decades, whether there are any lessons that can be learned um, in Beijing looking at the US-China mm. relationship, you know, it, our uh, government officials in Beijing kind of taking notes and seeing how they can um, adjust their strategies in Pakistan, their relationship in Pakistan, in order to try to avoid some of the pitfalls that the US found itself in. Um, and then the other side of that coin, in terms of Pakistan, um, how is Pakistan viewing its relationship with China versus um, the relationship that it's it's had and continued to have with the U.S. Um, in these terms? Any lessons learned um, in Pakistan from the U.S. experience that we might see um, applied in future years in China? Go first. Beijing. She <laughs> asked about Beijing. <laughs> lessons that you should learn. <laughs> and is it, too? Um, well, what lessons? Well, I think from the Chinese perspective, they are very inclined to very much differentiating uh, their relationship with Pakistan and not even compare mm -hmm. the China-Pakistan relations to the U.S.-Pakistan relations. Um, I think the history does matter here. Um, in the in the memory of the Chinese government and the Pakistani government, I cannot recall a, a major fallout between mm -hmm. the two. I cannot recall a major period in the history that where these two countries really had a very hostile perspective of each other. So you could argue that there's a, there's a geography here, there's a mm -hmm. proximity, there's the factor of India. So neither side really a, a was able to afford to, to, have a, to have a hostile relationship. But I would say the general atmosphere, when you think about this side of the relationship and compare that to US-Pakistan relation, maybe there's some technical resemblance there, like Pakistan, uh, of course, their cooperation with China on the Uyghur issue, sometimes it's also codified, but on the broader, higher political spectrum, the nature is, uh, is, is, is very different. I would say that um, the extractive or rent-seeking policy that Uzar um, described that, um, that U.S. participated pretty much in that, in that process, I don't think China sees itself as particip has having participated in, in that because uh, regardless of what kind of rent that is available in, in Pakistan, China's support, or maybe you could argue that the, the level of support may have varied historically, but the support or the nature of that support has been consistent. Mm -hmm. So they understand, I think the Chinese understand the challenges operating in, in Pakistan, but on the other hand, there's also an, an emotional element to it that because of the, the, the India factor mm -hmm. and because of even, I would say, the counterterrorism or the US factor, mm -hmm. that China and Pakistan at different times feel that they share a sympathetic look at each other when they look at the, uh, the, the regional politics or the global politics. And if you look at what China follows not, China follows the non-aligned um, position, so that it does not seek alliance or ali uh, alliance with any country. But there are normally, well, historically in the past, years, two decades, there are three countries that, that have been described as having a pseudo or a semi-alliance relationship with China, North Korea, Burma, and Pakistan. And among all these three countries, Pakistan has always been regarded as uh, unquestionably, without any doubt, China's buddy. So I would say the, uh, that's the difference. Yeah, I, I, well, I just think that the issue of geography is very strong here, that China in some ways doesn't need to learn some of the lessons that the U.S. learned because its whole approach has been different. And I think if there's one lesson to learn 
pick a very specific one, which would be do not give coalition support funds <laughs> because it's just it's you know it's like a cash in your pocket situation where um, it got better over time, of course, where there were more um, kind of reporting requirements and follow up and looking at how things were spent, but. When it started, it was so loosey goosey, and I just think that that set us up really poorly. Well, uh, you know, on the um, issue of the co coalition support funds, I think the Chinese have a different approach. They're actually making the Fox Sunnies pay for the security of their own personnel. That's right. So maybe they've uh, learned a lesson there. Um, and it's actually the, the Fox Sunny electric power uh, consumer who will be ultimately paying, or maybe the Fox Sunny state through, um, you know, through um, issuing bonds and all that. So, <coughs> so I think that kind of it deals with, um, you know, some of the you know changing aspects of the Sinopoc relationship uh, since the launch of CPAC. You know, initially it was a, a highly military to military relationship. Now there is this economic angle, and there have been some discussions in Pakistan, you know, uh, both in in the civil and military space about becoming overly dependent on China. And so I think you know this pivot towards China in terms of the economic relationship perhaps began maybe uh, notionally as a, a kind of a hedging strategy to indicate to the United States that we have options, but you know, nobody else came to the table. And so it, it wasn't a, you know, a rallying cry for other investors to come in, uh, partly because of the uh, singular commitments or um, um, uh, privileges that the Pakistani state afforded to uh, Chinese investors, but you know, maybe there are other issues as well. Uh, so there is this issue of economic dependence and then also uh, securitization of the relationship uh, in terms of you know physical uh, personnel or Chinese nationals that are on the ground and, uh, and I think you know that's something that um, um, you know uh, relates to you know what are China's ambitions in Pakistan does it really want you know um, tens of thousands of Chinese workers to be present in the country to move around freely you know uh, what is this kind of um, you know what's the uh, you know, what are their expectations for security? Uh, so are, are there supposed to be, you know, um, security personnel that guard, you know, every single Chinese national across the country? Or is it simply, you know, dedicated for these very specific CPEC projects where you have, let's say, you know, uh, several hundred Chinese engineers come in and then after three years they go back home? Uh, so that's uh, one element of uncertainty that kind of reflects the similar dynamics that, um, it reflects some of the dynamics that uh, animated the U.S. Pakistan relationship during the height of, you know, the Kerry Lulu sort of period. Yeah, I would just add. I think the one thing to watch out for, and I saw this about six months ago when I was there in Pakistan, is the mutation of terrorist radical ideology, and that's beginning to sort of include the Chinese and in sort of the mm -hmm. apocalyptic prophecies in radical Islamic groups, um, and the ideologies around Gog and Magog. And I won't get into the details of it, but I saw a video which had about a quarter of a million views on YouTube which was a mullah in Urdu talking about how CPEC is part of this plan of Gog and Magog to come from China all the way into the Middle East. It's kind of harebrained, but it fits into this <laughs> ISIL, uh, uh, ISIS I ideology is, is, uh, is if we follow it. And I think so what Samuel Huck said is sort of, for me, caught my eye because mm -hmm. it sort of links to that. Mm -hmm. And that mutation is something to worth watching out for. And the CPEC security forces essentially uh, are to guard against that risk. Um, and we don't know where this will go, but you know, uh, the amount of investment the Chinese are making, and uh, particularly in Balochistan and KPK, the, the feathers that they're ruffling, you may see a weird mutation of like the Uyghur movement, which we're seeing some issues around in Pakistan on, um, and this, this mutation of apocalyptic ideology that may have an impact, but it's too early to say that. But I've seen some videos that are you know, showing th there's evidence that they're transitioning towards that. You watch some strange videos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell the NSA. <laughs> they already know. Or, or Albright Stonebridge. <laughs> 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 uh, well, thank you guys so much. Um, that was really, uh, really good to get your perspectives. And I think there's a lot there, um, a lot that we need to dig in into too in the Q&A. So I want to open things up to the audience for questions. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you can please wait for a microphone to come around before asking a question and remember to identify yourself, that'd be great. All right, please go right ahead. Right there. <laughs> yeah, my name is Kelly, but I'm um, from Pakistan, Pakistan, India. 
And the question is that if they want come, they both can choose. The perception about Pakistan in terms of receiving, I mean, it's not, corruption is not a, you know, it doesn't take trillion of dollars, but if you could change the perception of Pakistan that it's not one of the most corrupt or most corrupt nation on earth, do you think that would help? Uh, the, the way you describe Pakistan economic situation, there is no econometric model that would improve the situation of this country on a technical basis. It's only if perceptions are changed that Pakistan is not very good. And then you have to just want to see the think in, in context. Like, I mean, according to your statistics, Pakistani labor is not worse off than Bangladeshi labor. And I could tell you, knowing a little bit about India, Pakistanis are not worse off than Indian uh, average person. So things are not really that bad that we kind of, you know, we going into details about econom uh, your economic statistics. So if Imran Khan is able to do, let's say, something about uh, land reform, uh, some change perception about uh, corruption, and expanding the tax base in Pakistan, do you think it would do any sense that would help to get Pakistan out of their economic crisis? Absolutely. Great. Let's take a couple more questions in the interest of time. Um, sure, on the left. Um, I'm Ibrahim. I, I'm a student here at NYU. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you to all the panelists for the insight that you provided. Uh, my question was, um, so since partition, Pakistan seems to have always been in this pers like perpetual self-perception as a security state. And because of that, uh, there's, a, there's a very popular narrative that security and defense have been the main beneficiaries of whatever financing that Pakistan has received. Do you think that that has con contri contributed to the unsustainable nature of like the uh, whatever growth that Pakistan has tried to achieve? And if so, uh, would an improvement in relations with, suppose, India, contrib like help uh, uh, allow Pakistan to invest in education, infrastructure, technology, on a more si for a more sustainable uh, model of economic growth? Thank you. Hi, I'm John Dan Lowitz. I'm here on behalf of Bauer Group Asia. Um, my question ties into the question on corruption a bit. Um, in the last six months especially, maybe to a year, uh, with the example of Hambantota and Matala in, Singapore, in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh of all country taking a strong stand against uh, CHEC, we've seen in the South Asia region a pushback on sort of this state level corruption coming out of Chinese backed projects. Do you think that this is having an effect on the narrative within Pakistan and that it's l leading to a greater awareness of the corruption threats from CPEC and whether that's having a greater trickle down effect on addressing corruption writ large or if that's just a very specialized focus on we don't want China to securitize its investments in Gwadar? Thanks. Uh, so first question on the, uh, whether Imran Khan will be able to improve the perceptions of Pakistan and that potential impact. Well, some of the reforms that he mentioned, land reform, uh, anti-corruption measures, you know, those are important for, you know, foreign investors, but I think, you know, one of the major concerns they have is the security of their, of their investments inside the country, uh, protection, legal protection. So, unfortunately, you know, you have a highly interventionist ju judiciary, which has overturned or nullified certain major deals. Uh, that's, you know, Pakistan, the Pakistani state specifically has been a net loser out of that. But uh, when you go, if you go back to the 1990s in terms of some uh, independent power projects to Rico Dig and some of these other deals, uh, you know, the judiciary is a big factor. So I think when uh, countries want to make, um, you know, large-scale investments in, inside Pakistan, uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is, uh, you know, the role of the interventionist judiciary and then the change of government. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, and corruption, anti-corruption, land reform, you know, those issues are important to helping, you know, the Pakistani economy um, thrive, uh, evolve, um, you know, giving uh, capital to the common citizen, you know, land and, and their title rights and all that. So that will help in terms of, you know, the economy's long-term growth. But I think, you know, these other uh, issues such as the courts and uh, the actual, you know, the security of their investments are probably more important. Yeah, I mean, it definitely has contributed to it, and it is a problem, right? Like, you've had 
uh, a security state that you know where the armed forces makes DHAs. They run amusement parks. I grew up eating fuzzy cornflakes. Maybe some of you did. Like, why was the army making cornflakes? I don't know. But you're very um, healthy, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not because of that. Fortified, <laughs> iron um, You know, so it, it, it definitely has had an impact. And it's not, I would not just talk about just the security state itself and not just the military. It's again what I described as the, the, the three pillars of the rent seeking state it's the, it's the boots, mm -hmm. it's the bureaucrats, it's the business interests. And they've aligned in such a way that you cannot have. Um, a sustainable uh, growth period. And if Imran Khan, for example, has to grow Pakistan, if you look at the examples of all governments in the country, even over here, administrations, they can at most do two bigger, major things, maybe three if they have a great time. But you know, one to two is big. So what can Imran Khan do out of those one or two things that can sustainably set Pakistan on a path of growth? My view is like solve the energy sector problem. Um, because the, 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 the circular debt in the system and the uncompetitive nature of the energy markets means not only that you're uncompetitive globally, but the crowding out effect on investments is huge, like billions, hundreds of billions of rupees a year are pumped into this sector from the banking system that can be spent elsewhere. And then secondly, improve the skills development program of the country. You cannot have 20, 25 million children out of school and run a 21st century industrialized state. Like, it's not possible. And those two would be my priority areas for his government, and hopefully they can do something about it. Can I just say something on that? I think, well, <clears throat> your question points to the U.S.-Pakistan case study, which is like the biggest kind of example of how you know foreign funding can prop up the military and create this imbalance between civilians and the military. And we've seen it kind of since the 50s, essentially. And it, it got pretty extreme after 9-11. And I think now that um, U.S. security assistance is basically at zero, I think. Um, and I don't think it's going to go back to kind of the war on terror levels ever again. Um, I, I do think that there are questions about how the military will maintain kind of that position, um, just based on what they were getting from the US. It wasn't just like coalition support funds. There was all kinds of equipment and training and assistance. And sure, they can get it from the Chinese too, which I think that's clearly been the kind of the replacement for the US. But Chinese equipment is not as good as the American equipment, right? So there are all these, the, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> so I mean, there are all of these kind of, the, I mean, the devil is in the details in some ways, right? And for another uh, example to just ponder is when the Obama administration passed the Harry Luger Bourbon legislation, which basically gave like, it was a multi-billion dollar package to strengthen the civilian government. That's really what it was for. It was all development focused. And the military really was outraged by that. And they saw that as a threat, a direct threat to kind of their supremacy in, you know, within Pakistan at that time. And so I just, you know, and it was kind of a lesson for the US that, you know, even though we felt like we had consulted everyone that needed to be consulted, it didn't matter, right? And there are all these other politics associated with it, but um, I, I don't see that dynamic going away. If it's not the US, it's someone else. And the, the institutional interests will still persist. I should say I'm a China analyst. I don't speak for China. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. I didn't mean to like point no, at no, you. No, 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 no. On the issue of the, the corruption and the Chinese projects in, in, in Pakistan, I would say that, well, I've, I've worked a lot on China Africa, and there's even more discussion as for whether China is, uh, is, is contributing to the corruption. I think China certainly is. But I think it's also fair to say that China did not create a problem. The extractive rent-seeking system in Pakistan was not set up by the Chinese, but <laughs> the Chinese play along, and they certainly would like to play along and to make business opportunities more prosperous and more more feasible when they uh, when they when they when they do business on, on the ground. So they certainly have not contributed to the improvement of the problem. Um, but then, to give you a, a almost like a joke, um, in in the Chinese answer to the if you look at how the Chinese government officials or some of the policy analysts answer the question of corruption, for example, in the case of Africa, the Chinese actually have an argument that because our concessional loans and our investment have been primarily used to purchase, to procure Chinese service and products, we are contributing to the elimination or the mitigation of the corruption problem in Africa or on the ground because money doesn't go there. The money only <laughs> because the money only changes accounts in the in the in the Chinese bank from this bank account to another Chinese bank account. <laughs>
So, um, or certainly not contributing to the, to the corruption <laughs> problem. Um, but I, I think for serious analysts, uh, we don't really take that up as a, as a, as a, as a very logical argument. Um, but in the, in the case of, of Pakistan, I would say that simply because of the scale of the Chinese input into, into the country and the many projects that the Chinese are invo uh, involved in, I think the, the issue of corruption certainly is not rare, and based on the complaints from the civil society and from observers and, and media, is certainly not a rare problem. And it has gathered more attention, it has invited, in, invited more scrutiny. Um, but I think from the Chinese perspective, will this, will this issue become a threat to China's current projects in, in Pakistan? Um, I think there, the Chinese perception is as long as they maintain a very good relationship with the head of the household, <laughs> 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 they will be able, and, and also provide the new toys. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're relatively comfortable and feel relatively secure about their, uh, their economic investment, at least more than others. And I, th I think, you know, in terms of the pushback against uh, Chinese corruption or alleged uh, Chinese corruption, uh, you know, you've seen that when there's been a change of government, so in Bangladesh and Malaysia, uh, and then there's been a change of government in, in Pakistan as well. So, uh, you know, I think that reflects, um, you know, the kind of, um, I wouldn't say anxiety, but something akin to anxiety, on, on at least in terms of the Chinese presence in Pakistan. You know, they're very keen to meet with the new government, all the major <coughs> players, uh, early on, you know, soon after the elections. Uh, the um, Chinese ambassador to Pakistan wrote a letter to the incoming uh, parliamentarians inside the country and um, you know, pledged that uh, China would emphasize investments that uh, facilitate Pakistan's exports and um, you know, bolstering its agricultural sector. So, uh, so I think you know, there's a recognition that when there's a change in government, people open the books uh, you know, from the previous five years or whatever, the previous tenure, uh, and, and look at it with great scrutiny. So that's why, for example, you know, with the Hamban Sosa case, you know, the New York Times had a very um, you know, detailed expose earlier this summer, and it's because you know, the new government um, was exposing you know, a lot of the sort of the dirty deeds of the past, previous government. So there is that, um, there has been that um, discussion in Pakistan. So PTI was you know, the leading opposition party, or one of the two leading opposition parties in the previous government, but now it's in power, and so uh, it has its own you know, rent-seeking interests as well. Um, and then also the Chinese, um, you know, er, when CPEC was initiated, there was a debate as to whether the, uh, the sort of the spoils of CPEC or the, the funds were being evenly distributed across the country. And so in December 2017, uh, uh, there was a sort of uh, a joint China Pakistan meeting that was held in Beijing, and they essentially, you know, gave, you know, spread the kitty in, and, um, you know. Uh, allocated some projects for you know public transport basically in each province. So, uh, so I think uh, you know the Chinese mission in Pakistan has an ability to really manage these um, these diverse constituencies inside the country, and so um, you know it's very much similar to what happened after <laughs> 2008 with Kerry Luger. All these people, you know, they're, uh, the largest number of um, Chinese mo uh, uh, China hosts the largest number of uh, Pakistani foreign students now, so it exceeds that of the United States. And so you know, there are Pakistanis studying in Chinese medical schools and business schools and so on and so forth, and some very good schools. Um, so, you know, so I think they know how to sort of manage some of the challenges there, uh, reputational challenges. Could, could I just add one thing on per, um, perception that you mentioned? Um, when I speak with businesses, all non-Chinese businesses, what th the only thing they really ask is how long is he going to stick around mm -hmm. when they're talking about like the government, right? It could be Nawaz Sharif, it could be Zardari, it could be Imran Khan, it doesn't matter. How long is he going to stick around? Because they know that, you know, as, as Arif mentioned, like there's political transition and they know what the challenges are. And the Chinese are more immune to the, those kinds of things. They're in it for the long game. But the rest of the world is not in it for the long game, right? There's a totally different calculation that goes along with you know, investing in Pakistan if you're a non-Chinese <laughs> business. And political stability sends a very powerful message to the outside world. And so it, it's not enough that he's kind of fa a favorite of the military. It's not enough that he's talking about corruption, which by the way, looks like he's going after his political opponents, right? If you are looking at it from this side of the kind of, you know, ocean. 
Um, and expanding the tax base is great, but that's never going to happen, right? I mean, that's such a big picture thing. So I think that um, that like there are other things that can answer those questions, and a, a kind of a strong political government can often give more confidence than saying we're going to you know have a whole new tax regime, for example, right? Because these are we're thinking short term, we're not doing long term. Can I ask a question back, please? Sorry. Uh, just to, to to follow up on that. So it is true that during the government transition period, um, in various countries, not only Sri Lanka, but also Malaysia, and Burma, Zambia, especially during the campaign and election season, the Chinese deal to this uh, um, the incumbent government was really scrutinized and really it becomes a much bigger issue. But like, uh, like, like um, we just mentioned is that China's here for the long game. So the Chinese understand w very well that after the new party or the new government comes in, guess who has lost cash in the pot? So I think the Chinese are more or less adapting themselves to this new reality that during this political transition mm -hmm. period, they are going to be scrutinized and there are going to be bad publicity associated with the Chinese project. But after that new government assumes office, they will still come to China with mm -hmm. a proposal that we need mm -hmm. this much funding from, from the Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid that is all the time we have this afternoon. Um, it is safe to say I think this is going to be the start of uh, many conversations. So we hope that you all um, and our panelists as well will uh, join us again at some point to follow up on more of these issues in the future. But um, thank you so much for attending, and please join me.